topic. So if, if I'm going too quickly or you have a question, please jump in. I'm happy to stop whenever you want me to. Um, these boxes kind of explain what the pension system is, how it, how it came about. It was established in 1946, and that was done by a resolution passed by the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. Um, we are a defined benefit pension plan, and that means that our benefits are defined by statute. And we pay benefits to the employees of the County of Sonoma government, the Valley of the Moon Fire District, and the Superior Courts. So if you are employed by any one of those agencies, you are automatically a member of our retirement system. Um, the benefits are set by the Board of Supervisors. That's an important distinction. The retirement system doesn't set any of the benefits. We don't negotiate with employees. We don't decide what formulas are going to get paid. We don't do anything like that. All we do is administer what the Board of Supervisors has negotiated. So that when people complain about benefits being too rich, that wasn't our fault. That was the fault of the Board of Supervisors. Um, and really, up and down California, it was the fault of some legislation that got passed back in the day. But that's a whole topic for another speech. Um, we are governed by our retirement board, and that retirement board has plenary authority over our retirement system. And plenary means absolute, so that's, it's constitutional. Our board has full control. The Board of Supervisors does not get to come in and dictate to us where we invest our money, how we do our financial reporting, how we pay benefits. That's all decided by our board. So this is a little more detail about what each entity does, um, the Board of Supervisors is really responsible for all the hiring and firing decisions for their employees. Same with the governing bodies of the other districts that I talked about, the fire district and the courts. They are making the hiring firing decisions, they're making decisions about what goes into salary. Some of that salary gets counted for pension benefit purposes, some salary does not get counted. The, the Board of Supervisors and the, the employers are really making those decisions about what to pay people. They're making decisions about an ad hoc COLA benefit that the retirement system can recommend, but we cannot grant. We are one of the few systems in California that does not have an automatic COLA program. So our retirees have not had a COLA since 2008. It's based on our reserve levels. And if our reserve levels are zero, or in our case negative, we are not able to recommend a COLA. Um, they do the financial reporting for their own county entity. 
On the other hand, the retirement board, we really, as I said, administer what gets the plan as designed by the county. We monitor member accounts, we council members, we do benefit estimates, we let members know how to purchase service, if they're eligible to do that. We uh, determine eligibility for retirement, disability, and death benefits. That's something that our board does. We um, recommend the COLA if there's reserves, and we do all the financial reporting for the retirement system. This is our mission. And our purpose is to provide and protect retirement benefits. And you might wonder at the word protect. If we don't set the benefits, what does it mean to protect the benefits? To us, we think that means making sure that only eligible people get paid retirement benefits. We think it means investing in prudent investments and making sure that we're not taking unnecessary risk for the return that we need to get. It's setting prudent actuarial funding policies to make sure that we're measuring the plan every single year and we're setting appropriate contribution rate. That's how we look at the word protect. We looked at this mission statement a couple of years ago and we kind of wrestled over that word protect, but we decided that it really is appropriate for the role that we play. As I mentioned, we're governed by a nine member board. Those are both elected and appointed members. We've got some active retire or active members, which are people that are employed by our plan sponsor agencies that sit on our board. We have retired members that sit on our board. We have members of the community that don't have any ties to county government. The treasurer sits on our board, and we have uh, other members that sit on our board. Uh, board, excuse me, we have a board of supervisors member that sits on our board. That happens to be David Rabbit, who tapped Joe on the shoulder. Um, as I said, our board is a fiduciary. We're governed by the California Constitution, and our main objective is to act in the best interest of our plan participants and their beneficiaries. So everything we do and every dollar that we spend out of our trust fund, we have to ask ourselves, is this benefiting our membership? If it's not benefiting our membership, we are actually not allowed to spend dollars on that. Um, the board, I have a very good policy board. It's one of the reasons I wanted to come to Sonoma County when the job came up. They are nose in, fingers out. They set policy level, they leave the details of the policy to the staff. That is a very, very good board to have. There are other boards out there that are more interested in getting down into the details and they tend to cause a lot of problems for the people that are trying to run the retirement system when they're constantly having to answer up to their board members. Our board has a very good balance of, of policy versus procedure. We have CEO charters, we have a chief investment officer charter that lays out the delegation of those duties, and we have a retirement board charter and committee charters that also lay out the delegation of all those duties. So this is a little more detail about who our board members are. We've got four that are appointed by the Board of Supervisors, and those are the ones that don't have any connection to county government, with the exception of David Rabbit, who is our supervisor member. And you might think, that's kind of weird. If the supervisors don't have any control over your retirement system, how come you have them sitting on your, your pension board? That's something that they baked right into the statute. And they wanted a mix of people from different parts of the county to sit in and provide varied uh, opinions about how the retirement system is being run. It's actually really nice to have a supervisor member on the board because you do have that direct tie to the county and we have personnel that work for us that, that are actually county employees, so we have personnel decisions that we coordinate with the county. Uh, we've got four that are elected, and those are the active members. Uh, we've got some general, and we've got safety members, and we have a retired member and a retired alternate that sits on our board. And then the treasurer sits by virtue of his office, so as long as he's sitting as treasurer, he is a member of our retirement board. The others have a three-year term, so every three years they either need to be reappointed or re-elected. We've been real lucky to have a consistent board, and so we've got some long-tenured people on there. That's really important for us because it's a steep learning curve when somebody comes in to learn everything there is to know about how to run a retirement system. And we tend to get board members that are interested in doing that, and they, once they learn it, they stick with us. We think that's really very helpful for us. This is a look at our active membership. We've got, uh, as you can see, Sonoma County has got by far the largest number of members. We've got both general and safety members. Our safety members are those people that are engaged in active law enforcement or active fire suppression. So all the deputy sheriffs out there, you've got probation officers, correctional officers, 
firefighters, they're all members of our system. Uh, the Superior Court obviously has just general members and the Valley of the Moon is our fire district with just a few uh, general members and mostly they've got safety members. So this is a look at our membership. This is uh, our total plan you'll see in the little box over here. It's, uh, we've got about 10,000 people. We are uh, fairly evenly split between active and retired, which means we're a mature plan. And being a mature plan typically means that you don't quite bring in enough contributions from your members and your employees to pay benefits, or members and employers, excuse me, to pay benefits. So you're typically having to do cash management and looking at your investment and making sure you've got enough cash on hand in order to make those monthly benefit payments. Um, we get people retiring out at about age 59 if there are general members and 52 if there are safety members. And we typically have them in for about 17 years before they go out and retire. That 17 years means that we've got 17 years to take their contributions and grow them with investment earnings in order to be able to pay them a lifetime benefit. We've been fairly successful at doing that and we model all of our assumptions and, and look at this 17 years really closely. We specifically look at our investment return over that 17 year period to see if it's at or above our assumed uh, investment return rate. Our average benefit, despite what the newspapers like to report, it's only 35,826 bucks a year. And if you look over to that orange box, that's the distribution of, of how people get paid. So you've got 79% of our members are receiving 50,000 or less in their benefits. The rest of them you can see sprinkled out between 50 to 99,000 and we've got 3.25% that get 100,000 or more. Those are the ones that typically make the newspapers. Um, and it, seems, it makes it seem like that's all we're paying out is $100,000 benefit. Really difficult to get a $100,000 benefit out of our system. So a little bit about how our pension benefits are calculated. As I said, we're a defined benefit formula, which means we have a statute or several statutes that describe how the benefits are paid. And the formula has a percentage, and it's based on your age, and you've got times your final average salary, and Sometimes it's a one-year average, sometimes it's a three-year average, times your years of service. And that's true for every member of our system. Um, we have two plans. We've got our legacy plan, which is plan A, and those are typically people that were in the plan before January 1 of 2013. Plan B is the PEPRA plan, and that's the statewide law that went into effect in January 1st of 2013. And the entire state of California, all the public pension plans went to a new formula for both its general and safety members. That new formula had lower age factors, it has a cap on the compensation that can be earned, and it's a three-year average instead of a one-year average salary. So the intent behind that was obviously to lower the pension costs, and it's doing just that. We've got about 30% of our membership that's in that PEPRA plan. That number will continue to grow while the plan A people will continue to retire out of the plan. And you know, within maybe 10 years, you'll see a real switch between the, the um, makeup of our membership. So how do you become eligible for a pension? Well, it's based upon years and it's based upon your age. So depending upon what plan you're in, you can see up there the difference between the two. You've got a 10 year age 50 for plan A and plan B. If you're general, it's five years, age 52, and safety is five years and age 50. We also have two types of disability retirement, and, and basically the criteria there is you are permanently unable to do your job anymore. And that's something that the board specifically has to determine. The other service retirement stuff, that's all statutory, so our board doesn't need to approve those. We just put them on the agenda and say, here's all the people that service retired different with the disability retirements because the board is there making a judgment call. And it's basically a medical judgment call about whether somebody is injured or ill to the point where they can no longer do their job. If you find out that they are, you then look at the second step, did it, the work cause that injury or illness or did it not cause that injury or illness? If it did, then we grant a disability retirement and the member can get 50% of their final average salary tax free. Because in the eyes of the IRS, this is a work-related injury, it's a work-related benefit, and you get that tax exempt. 
if the person was otherwise entitled to their service retirement, and that happens to be more than that 50%, then they will get up to 50% tax-free, and then the rest will be their service retirement piece, and that'll be taxed. Yes, sir. We, I just looked at those assumptions as a matter of fact. We have, we assume about 40, I'd say about 40% of our members are gonna go out onto some form of disability. That's not necessarily true that they actually do go out, but that's the assumption that we put out there. We have a very low, very low incident of disability. We see one or two a month. Unlike other systems that, you know, there's a whole lot of disabilities going on there. We have a very low, number of people that are actually going out. That's the assumption that our actuary uses, and I think they typically are conservative in their assumptions, so they shoot up beyond what is actually going out of the system. The police and firemen are higher in the fact that theirs are typically service-related disabilities. The, other, the general members, they, there's an even mix between service and non-service disabilities. So the non-service you can get if you are, like you get cancer or you get a heart attack or some other, other illness or disease that is not necessarily work-related and those are um, taxable. We also pay death benefits. Um, there's a couple different kinds of death benefits you can get. Typically it's a return of contributions, uh, but if you're eligible for some kind of continuance, if you're qualified for a disability retirement, and the fact that you're dead, you likely qualify for some kind of disability retirement, um, you will be qualified for a disability benefit. And I think that's part of where some of that 40% comes in. We've got some active member deaths to happen. And then after retirement, it really depends on the retirement option you choose. There's a couple of different ways that people can um, have their benefit paid to them when they ultimately retire, and there's certain continuances that go along with those choices. So how is our benefit paid for? We're paid for by employer and employee contributions, and there, there's some average numbers up there about how much those are, and investment income. And really, investment income covers the bulk of the benefit that we pay for. And you'll see here, this shows you a look at our revenue from 2013 to 2017, and those big blue bars are investment income. The little dark blue bar are employer contributions and the green bar is employee contributions. So we, I meant it when I said we take those contributions over that 17 year career and we do our best to invest them and grow them to the point where we're able to pay a lifetime benefit. Um, you should see, I showed you 2017, that's a breakdown of the income we received in that little box. So 394 million came in from our investment activities. That was a year where we happened to have a 16.4% return. We don't always have 16.4% returns as indicated by the other bars on that chart. Um, but, you know, it, it, investment income is by far the largest driver of income into the plan. Here's our expenses out of the plan. You will see that 96% of them go to pay benefits. As I mentioned before, we're a trust fund, so we are acting in the best interest of our plan participants by making sure that our expenses are down. There's 2% of our total fund. And then the refunds, those are people taking their money out and not drawing any kind of retirement benefit. They end their employment, they decide to withdraw, they take the money and leave. We try to talk them out of that because they should leave their money with us and eventually draw a benefit, but sometimes people want to take it. Yes, sir. We are typically on the low side. We run our staff pretty lean. I've got 13 people that, that run the retirement system. Um, and our investment expenses, we don't invest in private equity and hedge funds. So we typically have a low, maybe it's a 0.5% investment fee. So th those tend to be pretty low as well. So I would say we're, we're on the lean side as compared to our peers. That's correct. Pardon me? Do you have an outside audit that's done that's in other 
Yes, we do. And it's all of our actuarial expenses, everything is there, personnel costs. Yes, sir. They charge you that up there, I think it started in 2013, showing your income, investment income. Well, just prior to that, you could have gone for years with no investment I will show you a chart of our lean years at the end. It's a chart of our returns. Um, what happens when lean years come along? Well, we're, we're statutorily required to pay benefits, so we're required to pay benefits. Um, we do that by liquidating our investments and making sure that we've got necessary cash flow to make those benefit payments. And the idea is we take a really, really, really long-term view of the, of the retirement system because we are paying benefits out, it could be 50 years out. I mean, people can designate their child as their beneficiary to get 100% of their benefit. It gets reduced, but that could be paid out for 50, 60 years. And so our assumptions are typically looked at very long-term. Our investment experience we take a very long view of. So when we have single years of dips or a couple years of dips, we don't get real worried. If we see 10 years worth of, of investment problems, we're gonna go back and take a look at our investment assumption. And we're gonna make sure that we're being more conservative than, than we had been assuming in the past. In fact, we just did that. And we are in the middle of lowering our investment assumption from seven and a quarter down to seven. What is it now? Seven and a quarter, it's going down to seven. And this is due to the types of investments that we have. So I'm getting off track just a little bit, but our, act our, our actuary takes a look at our capital market assumptions based on where we invest our money. They make predictions, they look at a bunch of other factors, including inflation, and they give us a recommendation as to that long-term target. This year, it's gonna be seven. So here's our funded status. As you can see, on a market value basis, we're at 94%. And on a valuation basis, we're at 87%. Valuation basis means that we don't recognize our gains and losses every single year. We smooth those over a five-year period. And the reason we do that is because we want to give some kind of normalcy to our employers on their contribution rates. If we were recognizing our ups and downs every single year, we would be drastically changing our contribution requirements every single year. Instead, we choose to do that over a five-year period and have a more even trajectory for our employers in order for them to be able to budget for what uh, we expect of them. A couple of ways we manage risk. We talked a little bit about engaging an actuary and engaging an auditor. We take a look at our plan every single year. We do evaluation, which means we revalue the liabilities, we revalue our assets, we take a look at all of that experience in that single plan year, we compare it to all of the assumptions we have about when people are gonna die, when they're gonna retire, are they gonna be married, how old are they gonna be, uh, what's investments gonna look like, what does inflation and salary look like, and we compare it to our experience. And if our experience is off from those assumptions, which it inevitably will be, because we're never gonna be 100% right, we revalue the plan, we come up with a brand new set of contribution rates, and we communicate those to our employers and employees. So every year we're tuning up that plan. Every three years we do a more deep, deep dive into our assumptions and we take a look at experience over the past three and sometimes six years and we look at everything, mortality, we look at all of those assumptions that we have and we get a recommendation from our actuary on whether we need to tune those up. Did you have a question? How long do you have? <laughs> I can give you a couple of really short answers, which you may have all heard before. But back in the early 2000s, there was a Senate bill passed that increased all of the benefit formulas. And this was a time when all the pension plans were fat and happy, and they all had 100% or more than 100% funded. So the, the supervisors and the governing bodies of all of these cities and counties and the state said, what are we gonna do with all this extra money in the pension plan? I know, let's raise benefits. That sounds great. So they did, and they increased all of the formulas, but what they did in addition to that was they made it retroactive. 
So they granted all these benefits in 2002 and 2003 and decided that anybody that was working on those days was going to have all their past service upgraded at no cost to the employee. So that immediately ate up all that extra money that all those plans had. And that would have been just fine, except that you had a couple of stock market problems. You had a pretty big recession in 2008, and you had a couple of other things that happened. I think the tech bubble had just happened or happened right around that time period. And you had a couple other shocks that were going on in the markets. And so you take these extra rich benefits and you take all of this unfunded liability that you created when you made those benefits retroactive, you take the fact that a bunch of people decided they were going to retire, and you add in a mark, couple of market shocks, and you've got a recipe for disaster. And that's the, one of the main reasons why PEPRA came into play. In 2013, all across the state, the governor said, nope, we're done with those rich formulas, we're now going to have these lower formulas, and we're going to have some more you know, um, governors basically put on what goes into your pension benefit. Yes, sir. Real quick, um, a couple of points. First of all, the private sector can't sustain those models, okay? And everybody knows that. Most of us are private sector people. Mm -hmm. So why does government think that it can sustain that? And as good a job as it seems like you're doing, how can you sustain those models with guaranteed returns and stuff when you can't even perform like the S&P? And, and, and the second question, or the second part of that is, do you see in the future where government and municipal agencies will get out of the pension and even healthcare business, shift it over to the public employees unions or whatever? But I don't see how this sustains. I, I mean, it's great that you're doing that, but at the same token, the private sector can't do that. And if private sure. sector can't do it, I don't know how government thinks it can do it. And I guess that goes to the philosophy of, it, philosophy of whether you believe the defined benefit model works. And if you believe the defined benefit model works, you believe that grouping your money with, a, with professional investment advisors that are going to get you a better return than you can get out of your 401k or whatever your private plan is, and you believe that model works, and you believe that paying the normal cost of the plan, which is the plan, the benefit for everybody in the plan for another year of service, that's the normal cost. If you believe that 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 model works, then you're gonna believe defined benefit plans can work. We, like I said, take a long-term view. We have a funding plan that says in 20 years, the, the um, unfunded liability is gonna be paid off. We, the employer gets closer and closer to that every year. And then there's gonna be a huge market crash and something else might happen. I don't know the answer, exact answer to your question as to why it's the model that's in place the problem with switching from this particular model to a defined contribution model, which has been on the table an awful lot, is that you are gonna still be left with that liability from your defined benefit plan. That doesn't go away. What you do is you close the plan and make it more expensive. So again, defined benefit plans are supposed to work. They are not supposed to have benefits increased retroactively. That was really the death knell in a lot of these pension plans. Yes, sir. Uh this looks awfully complicated. Wouldn't it be much easier if public employees like the rest of the working stiffs were put on Social Security? Yeah. They're on Social Security. <laughs> we're integrated. <laughs> so employees are paying about 25% of their paycheck towards their retirement. I think we're out of time. <laughs> Julie, what a wonderful presentation. Let's all give a big round. Man, you've got the best PowerPoint slides. I am so envious. Thank you very much for your presentation and being our speaker. We have speakers for the speakers, so thank you kindly for the presentation. And once again, let's give her a big round of applause. What a great presentation on a tough subject.